Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm Ethan Pack. I'm a lecturer with the Nazarian Center and the Department of Comparative Literature. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for today is Dr. Neely Alon Amit. She is a researcher and lecturer of philosophy of soul and philosophy of education at Hakibutzim Academic College in Tel Aviv, Israel. During the 2020-2021 academic year, Alon Amit, Dr. Alon Amit is a visiting scholar at the UCLA Y and S Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. She previously served as an Israel Institute visiting assistant professor at the center. Dr. Alon Amit received her PhD in ancient philosophy from Haifa University. Her research explores the history of ideas from ancient Greece to modern times. She's the author of the forthcoming book on happy souls, the history of the soul in Western culture, which will be brought out by Cambridge scholars uh, this, this year. Uh, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for the event, including the Department of Comparative Literature, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, the Center for Near Eastern Studies, and the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. And I'll uh, remind everyone that we will be taking questions after Dr. Alon Amit's presentation, and there's a Q&A function, and so you can type your questions in uh, during and throughout the program, and I will kind of compile them and, and uh, share them with Dr. Alon Amit uh, at the end of the, toward the, later in the program. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Alon Amit. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to have you all here in this webinar about Hebrew literature of life and love. Um, I will talk about these three amazing poetesses, or actually two poetesses and one songwriter of um, pre-state and early state of Israel. Um, and I will talk about them in the context of my uh, forthcoming book about philosophy of happiness. So I will try to do all this together in 50 minutes. Um, wish me luck. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to hear them and answer. So let's begin. Um, first, a little bit about the context about my book. Um, this is my forthcoming book, Happiness, Stability and Transcendence, A Quest for Happiness Through Western Religion, Philosophy, Mysticism and Poetry. Um, in this book, what I'm doing is I'm tracking the idea of happiness, the concept of happiness, from the Hebrew Bible until contemporary poetry. And um, at my chapter about Hebrew poetry is what I will present to you today. So this is the general context. Um, all the photos you see here, unless mentioned otherwise, are taken by myself. Uh, while writing the book, it's also a journey of uh, photography that I did and poetry, and it comes together in the book. But today, you'll only see a few photos and, um, as I said, a chapter about the poetesses. Um, in the book, um, this is the table of contents. What interests us today is chapter two about the Hebrew Bible. I will refer a little bit to the Bible. And chapter 12 about the poetesses and how they refer back to the Hebrew Bible, again, in the context of happiness. As you see from the Hebrew Bible until the poetesses, a lot happened in world literature. I go through uh, Greek philosophy and um, medieval mysticism and early modern philosophy and literature. Um, so what I will try to show you today is how um, Hebrew poetry comes into play within the general scheme of world philosophy of happiness. So what is happiness? Um, this is what I always ask my students in the first class. Um, we see three emojis here, which one of them would be happiness to you? Of course, everybody would think it would be this one, the happy one, right, the smiley one, but no, not in ancient philosophy. Ancient philosophy of happiness is not about feeling happy. It's not about exaltation. It's about being okay, being well, okay? So uh, happiness means well-being in ancient terms, both in the Hebrew Bible and in Greek philosophy. 
So it's not about being happy. It's not about being sad. It's about being okay. It would be the middle energy, just being stable. If we look about the importance of happiness in world literature, Aristotle already tells us in the fourth century BCE that happiness is the end at which all actions aim, just to be well, that's all we want. And Margio, Mario Vergas Llosa, the Peruvian uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, author, says in 2001 that good literature, good world literature opens our eyes to unknown aspects of our own condition. Literature anytime, anywhere in any culture has something common. And we are trying to look at that commonality through happiness with a focus on Hebrew poetry. So the main uh, formula I come up with in my book is that happiness means stability and transcendence. In order to be happy or well, we want to have our two feet on the grand, ground or on this kayak, but we have to look up to some kind of transcendence, may it be religion, science, um, ideology, love of nature, uh, religion of labor, we will talk about that, anything that will make us connected and still feel stable. So we will look at these aspects through the poetry um, of the beginning of uh, the state of Israel. Just to go back to the root of happiness, the first time we see the word happiness in the Hebrew Bible, oshil in Hebrew, we see it in the sense of confirmation from without. Oshil comes from ishul, being confirmed. And the first time we see the word oshil in the Bible is in Genesis 30, when Leah says, happy am I for the daughters will call me happy. And therefore she named her son a shell. So being happy means being having some, some kind of outer external force confirming me. In Greek terms, eudaimonia, eudaimonia, eu is good, daimon is a demon. A good demon is dwelling upon me, dwelling in my house, therefore I'm happy. Some kind of external force is coming into me and helping me stabilize myself. In the Bible, and this is the last slide before we go into the Hebrew poetry, uh, we see us very nicely depicted by Ephraim Moshe Lilian in 1908. We see Abraham the patriarch looking up at the stars while God promises Abraham that if he will hearken to his voice, he will get a lot of blessings. I'm reading from here, Genesis 22 that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore, because thou hast hearkened to my voice. You will be stable, you will have blessing, you'll have a lot of children, as long as you stay um, on the ground, but hearken to the voice from above. So happiness is stability and transcendence. One more before we go into the poetesses. Uh, happiness has to do with understanding, with wisdom. Happiness is aligning with divine wisdom. We see that in language, for example, in English, understanding, we stand under the wisdom. In German, Felstehen, we stand before the wisdom. In Greek, epistemai, the same meaning. Let's go into the poetry. So these are the three poetesses I will present to you today. Some of them are very familiar. Some of the poems I will show you are less familiar. Um, we will talk about Rachel, the poetess, Rachel Blufstein Sela. We will talk about Lea Goldberg, and we will talk about Naomi Shemel. I will also uh, present to you uh, some of my own translations of the poetry of Rachel that has not been translated before into English, and some music, we will hear some music, so. Let's begin. Rachel. Uh, Rachel was born in 1890 in Saratov, Russia, to a very well-off family, a very cultural family. Uh, her mother was in a very uh, small cultural circle of learned women. She was corresponding with Tolstoy, for example. So Rachel grew up in this very happy house with a lot of brothers and sisters and a lot of literature going on there. Um, her mother passed away when Rachel was 16 years old. This was very traumatic for her. Her father remarried and Rachel and her older, and one of her sisters um, 
traveled away from that house. At the age of 19, Rachel um, decided to go to Italy to study art and philosophy. Uh, and on the way, she stopped for a visit in Jaffa. So Rachel's uh, coming to Israel during the second Aliyah years, the second uh, wave of immigration uh, to Israel, uh, didn't have to do with you know, burning ideology, Zionist ideology to go to Israel. She came there for a visit, but she fell in love and she stayed. She fell in love with the country, with the pioneering ideology, with you know, everything, the young people living together and building the land. And she went to live in Rehovot um, with her sister. They started learning Hebrew and Rachel started writing in Hebrew. Um, two years after she went to uh, Kineret, to the um, Kineret farm where women learned how to work in agriculture. Two years after that, she went to Toulouse, France to study agriculture, to get a degree in that. That's where the World War I caught her and she had to stay on European grounds for five years. She went to Russia and she worked with orphans and probably that's where she contracted uh, TB, tuberculosis. At 1919, um, just at the end of First World War, she came back to Israel with the first boat of the third Aliyah, the Ruslan. And uh, since she came back to the shores of Israel, um, she was already sick and at the age of um, at the age of one year later, at the, the year 1920, she writes her first poem in Hebrew and she is dedicating it to A.D. Gordon. This poem is called Haloch Nefesh or Faring of Soul or Mood. Uh, I translated it because there is no English translation of it um, with the permission of the um, Rachel archive in Israel. So I will read this poem to you. As I said, the context is happiness, but this is not a happy poem in the sense of feeling happy. She already knows she's very ill. She was um, asked to leave uh, Kibbutz Dganya where she was working. She started, um, these are years of her being um, like a nomad in, in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem years. She was very sad and very sick, but very productive. These are the years of her great poetry. So she writes, the day fared and darkened, the day had declined. A dimming gold paved the skies and the mountains of high. Around me blackened the breadth of fields, a muted breadth. My path has distance, my path is lonesome, my barren path. But I shall not defy fate's word, tyrannizing fate. I shall walk gaily toward all and all I should think. So even though she is sick and she is lonely and her dream of you know, working the land with her own hands is shattered because she is so sick and she is asked to leave the kibbutz, she is still thankful and she is still walking gaily. This uh, poem was written in the spirit of Gordon. Not only did she dedicate it to him, but she was very influenced by him. A.D. Gordon, just in brief, um, was a very interesting pioneer of the second Aliyah. Uh, he came to Israel at the age of 48, which was considered very late, and he worked the land and he wrote this amazing essays about, they're called religion of labor, how, you know, labor, we are fulfilled through the labor of our hands and through our connection with nature and Gordon writes, and I'm reading from the yellow part. But at times you feel a surge of cosmic exaltation like the clear light of the heavens. This is when you work hard. And you too seem to be taking root in the soil which you are digging to be nourished by the rays of the sun and share life with the tiniest blade of grass with each flower living in nature depths. You seem then to rise and grow into the vast expanse of the universe. So Gordon like Rachel feels that working the land or connecting will make you happy even though all the hardships. Um, this she wrote as Sfat Kineret. I also translated it, but I think because of time, I will jump to the next poem. Um, this poem called Gift Shai um, was written one year before Rachel's death. Rachel died at the age of 41 at 1931 from tuberculosis. Lonely, um, really all her dreams already shattered. She missed Kineret so much and she was in an apartment in Tel Aviv with very few visitors. 
this beautiful uh, song was the first one to be put into music in Rachel's life by a friend, uh, Yehuda Shirtok, later put into music by Naomi Shemil. We will hear that very soon. And uh, the poem expresses Rachel's connection with the Bible. I should also say a few words about Hebrew. At that time, this is the revival of the Hebrew language. When the poets are using Hebrew, they're going back to the Bible as their context because there's not a lot of everyday Hebrew going on. They actually invent Hebrew as to, as to speak. And in this poem, she lies heavily on the Bible. She writes about her being so shattered and so, you know, she has nothing to give, but still she is giving her all and it makes her happy. So it's called gift, shy. And it goes like this. I shall glean like a vine, the remnant of sound and send to you a tribute from the grapevine of my heart. All that the hand of sorrow hasn't yet uprooted that the furest east wind hasn't beaten of me. I shall drape the basket in memories of Kineret, morning sky of roses in the garden's trees, golden moon, noontime in the calming expanse and a lilac evening on the Golan Heights, memory of a crescent night on the lot of water. This is the cry of happiness as my days will rise. As in a crimson thread, I will knot my basket and send it to you, would you like my gift? So in the beginning, she is referring to uh, the book of uh, Genesis, gleaning, uh, sorry, Jeremiah, gleaning like a vine, e olel kagefen, means uh, after you pick everything from the vineyard, what's left there for the poor people, this is what's left in me. And in the book of Genesis, the dream of Pharaoh about the ears of grain being hit by the east wind, um, she feels like one of these gra grains. Uh, but she's still, she still not uprooted. She still has her memories of Kinneret and she can still tie them all together and give them as a gift. This is her cry of happiness. She still finds something to be happy about. So again, happiness is not about feeling exalted. It is about, you know, still being alive and still connected. So let's hear um, this song, sung by Ronit Ophir. We will hear a few minutes of it just to get into the mood and uh, the song is very much part of uh, Hebrew culture. Okay, because of my concern for time, we will continue, but you can get the sense of beautiful young Rachel singing the songs of uh, happiness uh, for Kineret, the Sea of Galilee, which she misses so much. La Goldberg uh, was born uh, two years after Rachel reached uh, the shores of uh, Jaffa. Uh, Lea Goldberg was born in Königsberg, Prussia. And uh, as a child, they had to travel a lot through Russia to Kovna, which is today's Lithuania. Um, she was an only child. Uh, she learned Hebrew um, from her self-initiative at a very early age. She wrote poems already as a child. Um, at the age of um, 18, I think, she went for a PhD in first in Berlin, then at Bonn. She graduated a PhD in Semitic languages. 
And she began writing poetry in, you know, in Kovna and in Germany. And later she came to Israel to join a circle of uh, authors and poets uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, Lea Goldberg um, is very well known in he Hebrew culture. She wrote poems and she wrote children's books. Some of them are known to many of us like Where is Pluto the dog? Uh, An apartment to let Dira Laskir. What do the does do? Um, so uh, a lot, a lot of uh, writing also. Uh, she was a playwright and she was a translator from seven languages and she was an academic. She uh, founded the Department of Comparative Literature at the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem in the 50s. Um, so this is Lea Goldberg. Lea Goldberg um, in one of her poems, which I would like to present to you today, is going back to uh, the Bible, to the book of Kohelet. Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, is one of the uh, books of wisdom, wisdom literature in the Bible. And it's a very interesting book philosophically. It's associated or attributed to uh, the King Solomon, who is sitting at an old age and reflecting on life. So even though King Solomon had everything, he was wise, he had many wives, he, had, he was very rich, he was very successful. At the very beginning of the book, he is saying, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Hevel havalim hakol hevel. What profit hath man of all his labor, wherein he laboreth under the sun? Um, a question we all ask ourselves from time to time. At, the, at uh, book three later in Koheret, um, he comes to some kind of conclusion. And this kind of conclusion, if it was the old man talking at the beginning, at book three, the, the conclusion would be of the um, mature person, you know, a person working and living and providing and understanding that there's some kind of logic to everything. There is a time for everything. So to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which has been planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So this would be the um, working mature person. At the end of Kohelet, and this seems sometimes a bit strange for this book, and some researchers think it may be a later edition, there is a religious, um, conclusion. Kohelet says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. This seems strange for this book because there's not a lot of talk about full submission to a religious feeling that will give you purpose in life. But still, this is the conclusion of Kohelet. Um, and Lea Goldberg is corresponding with this poem. This is Lea Goldberg's poem, Poems of the Journey's End. And in this poem, she is reflecting about happiness, about life, along the lines uh, drew, drawn for us by Kohelet. So it's uh, an anthology of three poems. The first poem uh, will talk about, um, well, we will read it, about the, the old man, the second poem about the, the middle-aged person, and in the third poem, she is talking to the very end of Kohelet, trying to see how could she submit to total religion, while Lea Goldberg, and this is important to mention, was a self-proclaimed secular author. She was not religious, but still, she is looking for this religious feeling in order to feel transcendence, in order to be happy. So, the path is so lovely, said the boy. The path is so hard, said the lad. The path is so long, said the man. The grandfather sat on the side of the path to rest. By the way, this is not my translation. It's Rachel Tzviya Bak. Sunset paints his gray head gold and red. The grass glows at his feet in the evening dew. Above him, the day's last bird sings. Will you remember how lovely, how hard, how long was the path? So this would be the first part of Kohelet. Now going to, to poem two, to everything there is a season, Kohelet three, let's see how she responds to that. You said, 
day chases day and night night. In your heart, you said, now the time has come. You see evenings and mornings visit your window and you say, there is nothing new under the sun. But now with the days you have whitened and aged, your days numbered and tenfold dearer. And you know, every day is the last under the sun. And you know, every day is new under the sun. So here is her addition to Kohelet. Not everything is va vain. You know, not everything is the same under the sun. We as human beings can renew. We can create something anew. So this, if you would like to think of it in the context of, you know, pioneering uh, Israelis or the creation of the land, um, we have some kind of common cause. We have some purpose. We can create something new. And therefore, there are also new days under the sun. The third poem, which is very important in our context, would be her personal um, plea to God. It's written in first person. She is talking directly to God and she is asking God to help her have this feeling of religiosity or connectedness or be or transcendence or something that will help her create every day anew. She says, teach me, my God, to bless and pray over the withered leaf secret, the ready fruits grace, over this freedom to see, to feel, to breathe, to know, to hope, to fail. Teach my lips blessings and songs of praise when your days are renewed morning and night. Lest my day be today like all the yesterdays. Lest my day be for me an unthinking haze. So, Lamdeni Elohai Barech Vehit Palel, teach me, my God, to pray. But what kind of prayer is she looking for? She is not looking for a religious prayer. She's looking for a prayer of gratitude, of acknowledgement of nature, of, of satisfaction in her work. Um, for the same thing that Rachel was so happy with, even though she could give nothing, she still had her memories of Kinneret and she still could create a, a poem, a song. So Lea Goldberg is also asking God, you know, just for ha happiness to be stable, to transcend and, you know, to, to feel purposeful. If we would like to uh, summarize, we're okay with time, um, a little bit what we did up to now in the context of happiness, so if happiness is aligning with divine wisdom, both Rachel and Lea Goldberg are expressing gratitude to fate, religion of nature and labor, living religion and secular prayer. Now we will go into Nomi Shemel. Nomi Shemel, uh, many of you have probably heard her very famous songs like Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold. Um, Nomi Shemel uh, was born a year before Rachel's death. She was born in Kinneret. Uh, so she grew up on the legacy of Rachel, and of course she knew Leah Goldberg. Uh, Nomi Shemel was um, a kibbutz member. Um, at, when she was at the age of drafting, 18, uh, she managed not to go to the army like all her friends, but to go study music. So she drafted at the very late age of um, 24. But for five years, um, she studied music, which was outstanding at that time for a person that age, first in the Tel Aviv uh, School of Music and then in uh, Jerusalem Academy for uh, Music and Dance. Uh, she was a gifted pianist and a gifted songwriter. Um, and as I said, very much ingrained in Hebrew culture. She wrote many songs that were very influential. Some of them were taken to be political, even though she never claimed they were. For example, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold, um, was written for a music festival in Jerusalem, and it was performed three weeks before uh, the Six Days War. The song that we will talk about now, Al Kol Ele, for all these, was written in the 80s around the evacuation of the Sinai Peninsula, and it became the, the hymn of uh, people uh, in the settlement of uh, Sinai. But again, uh, Nomi Shema didn't try to do anything pol political, or at least that's what she claimed um, in interviews. So for all these, Al Kol Ele by Nomi Shema. Um, we will read the song together and then we will hear it. Uh, a very uplifting, very happy song. Over the honey, over the bee sting. Oh, by the way, this is a popular translation. Um, I didn't even see the name of the translator, but it's on the Kululam website. And Kululam is uh, the performance we will see very soon. 
Over the honey, over the bee sting, over the bitter and the sweet, over our precious baby daughter, grant a blessing, dear God, please. Over the blazing fire, over the crystal clear water, over those returning homewards from travels afar. Over all these, over all these, grant a blessing, dear Lord, please. Over the honey, over the bee sting, over the bitter and the sweet. Please do not uproot what has been planted. Do not forget the hopes and dreams. Lead me home and I shall return to this wonderful land. So um, this part, which I marked in yellow, uh, was the hymn. Okay, and see, she also uh, refers back to Kohelet. There's time to root and uh, to root and time to unpluck what has been rooted or planted. Please do not uproot what has been planted. We try to find stability on earth. We are trying to be thankful for everything, for the honey and for the bee sting, for the bitter and the sweet, everything together. We're talking to you, God, please save us and you know, let us live as well as possible on this ground. She continues, shield dear Lord, this house of mine, this garden and these walls from sorrow, grief and sudden fear and from wars. Protect the little I have, the light, my children, the fruit, the fruit not yet ripened, picked before its time. A tree rustles in the wind, a star falls from afar, and in the darkness, I wish upon that star. Please watch over them all for me, my cherished ones. Bless the quiet, the cries, and bless this song. So she is asking God to bless everything, to keep everything, but most of all, to bless the song. We want to continue singing. We want to continue praising and praying and being connected. So this is her uh, request. We will now listen to the song. Um, so I mentioned Kululam. Kululam is um, um, some kind of social initiative um, started a few years ago in Israel where uh, people, they bring hundreds of people together um, in a big hall, uh, people from all walks of life in Israel and from all groups. You have Jews and Arabs and Christians and religious and secular and old and young, everybody together. They put them in three groups and they teach them to sing in three voices. And um, it takes, that's what they say, it takes around an hour to teach them the song and then they sing together. It's always very exciting. This uh, video was taped for the 70th birthday of the state of Israel. Um, you will see in the very beginning Israel's president, uh, Reuven Ruby Rivlin, um, turning the light on. You will also see him in the audience singing. So as I said, it's a very uplifting song of happiness and gratitude by Naomi Shemel.
I just had to show you the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Great. So um, this is the spirit of Naomi Shamil. Thank you for everything. And let us bless this song. Thank you for this good land. Um, just to wrap it up, um, the different uh, poems uh, and songs that we saw express the feeling of the request to keep ourselves rooted uh, either through work of the land, either through uh, gratitude, either to, through praise of nature, either through some kind of prayer, may it be religious prayer or secular prayer, but uh, we want to keep our song and keep ourselves okay. This is the expression of uh, Hebrew poets um, of the beginning of, and of the state of Israel. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, this is my email if you have more questions, and I'd be happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olin Amit. That was a fantastic pre presentation um, and covered so much ground. Thank so you. I'm going to take some of the questions that we've received. It was received from some great questions coming in now uh, from the q and I'm um, going to combine one question that we received with a question of my own, which has to do with your translations, um, particularly of the Rachel poems, and the challenge of translating sometimes when there might be a reference to something that in Hebrew is more familiar to a Hebrew readership, uh, in this case, you know, lines from the Bible or something, um, but is not as familiar maybe in English. It's, Ecclesiastes might be the exception because of, of the, the song from the <laughs> 60s, but um, 
and there was a question specifically in terms of your translation uh, with the uh, haloch as fairing and when you, um, how you choose to go, uh, when, when you might not, when you might need to use a non-literal word for word translation to convey something. So either, either aspect of that that you want to address. Well, thank you for this question. I was hoping you'll ask a question about translation. Um, just to share with you this uh, work of translation, when I was writing the book um, about happiness and looking for uh, the Hebrew poets, I found that this poem in particular was not translated into English. And this made me happy to take part, you know, because when you translate, you're actually, I don't know, touching the essence or connecting with the poet um, in a way. So at this time I read a lot about Wilson. I tried to, you know, get into her shoes. Um, and Haloch uh, Nefesh is usually translated into mood, as you said. Um, but I chose to write fairing of soul because I think that haloch, haloch means to walk, halicha. Um, there's some kind of journey expressed here and therefore just mood was not enough. I, feel, I felt a, a need to express uh, the journey, the walking of the soul. So fairing of soul would be the closest thing to uh, walking. Um, and this whole poem is a journey. The day is the day is walking or faring and darkening. You know, there's some kind of uh, movement expressed in this poem. And she's still walking, even at the end, I shall walk gaily, elech begil. She's still walking this path and she is thankful, even though the day is dimming, even though, you know, she knows she's ill already at this time. So she knows, you know, her life is dimming, but she's still walking, she's still hopeful. So that, that's why I didn't want, just want to call it mood. It had to be something larger than that. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. The translation is just, um, I don't know. It, it made me transcend. <laughs> yeah. A, a source, uh, that's the, uh, the transcendent above maybe is the, the source text or something. Um, so there's a few, uh, uh, actually uh, quite a few questions having to do with the position of these poets particularly Rachel and Leah Goldberg as, as women poets and how they stood in relation to the, their peers, the rest of the notable poets of their generation. Um, one uh, questioner asked if there was a distinctive feminine voice, um, if this, uh, were they viewed as minor poets because there weren't many women poets um, and, and then an, another way that I was, what we were discussing ahead of time was that there was this stated ideology of gender egalitarianism in, in the period and labor Zionism, but did they actually find that in their lives or were they, or their poetry treated in some way different um, because they were women? Oh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um... So there's a lot of research about Rachel and Leah Goldberg as women authors, especially Rachel because she wrote in that very sensitive time of beginning of modern Hebrew poetry. And she was almost the only woman poet. There are also uh, Yochebed Bat Miriam um, and others, but she was the most uh, prolific among them. Um, and um, uh, Rachel, uh, in one of the researchers, the researchers that I read, they're saying that Rachel tried to make everything very minor and beautiful. She had a lot to say, but you can't see a lot of anger or expression of very strong feelings. Everything is very subdued. And this, many people, many researchers think it has to do with, you know, the gender role because she is a woman poet. Um, she can't really express a lot, but try to beautify things. Also, Lea Goldberg, um, we know that um, she also, uh, many people looked at her as trying, you know, not very expressive, but making things more um, beautiful. So um, we know, for example, that uh, at, at Rachel's, uh, at 30 days after Rachel's death, there, uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik, you know, one of the very prominent male uh, poets of uh, the same period, um, gave a speech about uh, Rachel and he said that she said everything very beautifully. But you know, but beautiful is not enough. We were try trying to look for some expression here and we know that they had it, but maybe they still felt it, they had to subdue it because of uh, gender. 
and interesting. And so an, another question, kind of a related question um, has to do with their uh, relationship to love. Um, and as uh, one questioner wrote about that their, their lives, even maybe their romantic lives weren't particularly happy, um, but did they address love maybe in a more general sense of gratitude for the land or for the work, or um, did how did they get, engage with something more specific like interpersonal love? So they write a, bit, a lot about love, both Rachel and Leah Goldberg, uh, and they both were unmarried. And Rachel, many of you are familiar with her poem Akara, Baron. Uh, she couldn't, uh, she didn't have children, neither did Leah Goldberg. Um, so they're, they're writing beautiful love songs. Um, for example, Rachel, Zemir uh, Nuge, Hatishma Kuli, um, would you hear my voice, my far, my distant lover? She's talking to a distant lover. They both want to love and they're expressing uh, love. But as you rightly said, they both had um, lonely life stories. They both never married. Rachel passed away at a very young age, um, sick, even though she had uh, a lot of love affairs and she was very, uh, she was, uh, she had a lot of, you know, people loving her and courting her at the time when she was still healthy and beautiful. Um, La Goldberg never, uh, we know she had some um, love affairs, but she never um, materialized them. Um, so, and this is very interesting to look at this theme of love through the lives of uh, women who haven't really uh, materialized their loves. Um, Nomi Shemel, you know, was married, she had children, she, you know, she lived for a long time. She was, you know, she's the modern Israeli uh, songwriter. Um, so she's, of course, she's also talking about love, but that would be more, you know, love of the land, love of, you know, Jerusalem, something more um, national, I would say, the, the, the songs of Leah Goldberg. Yeah, I was, I was trying, no, to, think, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was trying yeah. to think of a way to convey in like American terms who, who, she, who she would be, but it's, you know, there's no, bigger than Joni Mitchell or, <laughs> it's, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a, a, a level of, of fame and, and uh, recognition that we almost without parallel in Israeli society. Um, a few quick specific questions about the Naomi Shemer and Uncle Ela. A few people wanted to know who was the male vocalist in that video. Um, the president Ruben Rivlin, was in the crowd and in the beginning you saw him turning on the lights. But the main singer is Shlomi Shabbat um a very very famous singer very well loved this whole performance of Kululam not only is it so exciting because you see all these different people of Israeli society singing together coming together and you know the uplifting music but also the singer who is um, very very loved and prominent in Israeli culture Shlomi Shabbat that's the answer and and um with Naomi Shemer did she um, um, typically ad adapt songs that were where the lyrics were already written and she composed the music or was it even that other people composed the music and she was just the, the singer and the vocalist or uh, you know what was her role in, in some of her famous songs as far as composition? Uh, well as we saw she composed Rachel's songs and other songs but she I think most of her work was her own songs uh, written and composed uh, we also see some songs that are um, structured around uh, world famous songs, for example, uh, Lu Yehi, structured around Let It Be. Um, many people are familiar with that one. Also, we know about a period of her life that she spent in Paris and she came back to Israel writing all these chansons, you know. So, um, yeah, she was very much um, in correspondence with the world around her. But I think most of her songs would be um, self written and composed. Interesting, interesting. And so then um, there's a few questions on, on the, I guess you could say the main, the main subject, which is the, uh, the happiness. Yeah. Um, so one would be whether the, this concept of happiness in these three authors is varies, or do you think it's um, distinct from Western cultural ideology of happiness? You're tying it um, to the ancient Greeks but, as, but you also at the beginning made a point to say that kind of where the ancient Greeks uh, define happiness, uh, how they define it, and how we think of it in a contemporary, um, you know, common sense. 
there's a little bit of a gap there. So I'd be curious uh, where you located them um, and, and someone else uh, wrote um, a, a, how you situate your research in the, the global research on happiness. Uh, someone wrote about Martin Seligman. So yeah, I guess on the, on the popular level and then on maybe the academic level. Okay, a good question, which I'm happy to answer about happiness. Uh, first of all, Martin Seligman um, is the founder of Positive Psychology, uh, which is um, a psychological school aimed at, you know, at happiness. You know, people come to the psychologist not only to, um, you know, come to terms with things or understand things about themselves, but we are aiming for a happy life. So it's a very... Um, I would say efficient type of psychology. Um, and it's very 20th, 21st century. It's not ancient at all, because as I said before, uh, ancient happiness would just mean living okay, living well. Now, if we look at um, the poetesses within the scheme of uh, world philosophy of happiness, um, so this would be another topic for a talk, which I would be happy to do. Um, what we see here in this table of contents is actually um, a, develop, a scheme of development. From the very initial root of happiness that we saw in the Bible, of being just confirmed from without and listening to the voice from above and then being promised all the uh, prosperity on earth, um, we see with time um, different um, analyses of happiness. So in Greek philosophy, we see in the pre-Socratics, for example, Heraclitus, um, this notion that the world is changing. We can't go into the same river twice. Everything is flowing. But there is this constant wisdom that you know, pervades the world. And if we connect with that wisdom, we are stable. We are well. We are happy. Um, it goes on into Plato, of course, uh, which most of you are familiar with. There is some kind of world of ideas in the sky, and we as wise human beings have to connect with these ideas um, mentally. We forget about matter. Matter doesn't matter. You have to connect mentally with the ideas, and then you are stable and happy. Um, Stoic philosophy, which is already the bridge uh, between uh, later Greek philosophy and you know, the beginning of the Middle Ages, uh, talks about um, the world being matter, material, and pervaded by logos, logic. Again, as human beings, our soul, which is our logical part within us, has to connect with this logos to be happy. So it's always, what I show basically in the schema, that's always about us, the material beings living in this material world, but connecting to God, to logos, to wisdom, each period defined it differently in order to be happy. When we go into uh, mysticism, Sufism, and then Kabbalah, again, this, this scheme of us here and that there is getting different shapes, spheres, uh, sphirot, but still uh, we always um, define our happiness by this channel, this connectedness to the wisdom uh, from above. So, um, when the question was, uh, how do they connect to world happiness? So um, when I write about it more at length, I just show that different aspects of the poetry um, actually portray this whole, you know, world development of happiness until it got to their period of time. Uh, there's some, a little bit of uh, pre-Socratic thinking and a little bit of transcendentalism there and, you know, Harlem Renaissance, which is like the rising of the people, um, is very much reflected later in um, in uh, Hebrew literature. So um, yeah, you could just go into the poems and uh, analyze them and see how much of world thought is ingrained in, already in the writings of poets that aren't, uh, you know, Rachel and Lea Goldberg and Naomi Shemel were very learned people. So they knew, I mean, you know, they've, they've read the philosophers, they knew about that, but it doesn't always have to be that you read Plato and that's why you write something platonic. It's, you know, it's the, the culture just diffuses into the, the writings. The Avira, it's, it's, out, it's just out there. Yeah, the, Avira, exactly. And, well, I would even just, on, uh, to further that, you know, in this contemporary, I'm not uh, familiar, as familiar with the, the Martin Seligman that you mentioned, but you would think in the contemporary moment, a common defi definition of happiness is find your bliss, you know, something that seems to be very 
you're going in, you're not reaching out. Um, so I, I mean, I'm sure that that's, you know, probably a book on its, on its own, but how, maybe how we got there, or do you think that, here's a more concrete question, do you think that the view of happiness in these three poets is distinct from that kind of find your bliss, do what makes you happy, you know, more internal happiness? Uh, so find your bliss, I think it's something more individualistic that you see more in, um, you know, uh, new age, uh, each person has their own bliss and you should go and find it, meditate, find your inner peace. Uh, it's all about you. But what I think is unique to um, early Hebrew poetry is that it's not only about myself. When I, when I write individually, I'm actually writing for the group. I'm part of this group of pioneers, of part of this group of ideologists. You can see that, of course, in Nomi Shemo that writes these national, you know, amazing songs, uplifting for, for the whole nation. But even in Rachel, you know, this very young person lying sick at bed in Tel Aviv after she was, you know, thrown away from the kibbutz, still, she's not writing only about herself. She's writing about herself as, you know, a person, a, a spoker for a greater group. Um, so happiness um, and find your bliss. Yeah, but the bliss is very defined. It's not my own individualistic bliss. My bliss would be to work the land. My bliss would be, you know, to, to build up this country, to be part of this group of pioneers, just to be a part of, of a, a specific group. Wow, wow that's fantastic. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. One last question uh, that was that a few people asked is, is when specifically is your book coming out? It said 2021, but... Yeah, well, yeah, I'm waiting. It's uh, at the publishers, um, so um, hopefully soon. I'll let you know. <laughs> we will be happy to to read it. Uh, thank very you very much. much. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to to thank you so much for for your presentation and for and for answering uh, so many of our uh, the questions. This, uh, you could tell that the audience was was very fascinated by many different parts of parts of this, and um, so we'd like to to thank everyone for participating. I thank Dr. Alona Meet for her, for her work, and as, as she has said, and I, I think uh, her email is in the is, yeah, is in the right chat here. or um, right she, here. She's uh, Alona at Amit at UCLA edu. She is happy to continue to to answer further questions, um, and uh, I think with that we'll we'll end the program and and go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you, everybody.